Allah kata, si chango hi atoma chasha. Neti chati ektomi akuno washte. Chanupakale wakayelo, meishma kachunuha. I guess what I was saying is hi, good to see you. Now, I did say hello, and I, I introduced myself as a Sioux or Lakota, Shichongu or Brule of the, um, the seven bands of the Lakota. I said that I was a natural human. Uh, I also said that the, uh, my name was Ektomi Okunawashte, which means the gentle spider. I don't know how many of you knew Jim Gillahan, but he was the keeper of Sitting Bull's pipe. It was given to him by, by the Fool's Crow, and Lame Deer gave him the gentle spider medicine. Uh, when a person carries that medicine, they're known as the tricksters. You got to watch them because they're going to get you caught up in something. <laughs> uh, just before Jim passed over, he asked if I would take the gentle spider. So this is generations old, and when you take that, that spirit, you also take that name that goes with it. I said that the pipe, the chinupa, is sacred and that I keep it for the people. Tonight I, I take this chinupa out and I hold it as I talk to you. That way you know I'm being sincere and honest with you. Uh, we never use this for anything but the positive. You know, in the old days, they said the Chinupa is a peace pipe. That's what the government called it. They called it the peace pipe because when, when they signed a treaty, the Lakota brought their Chinupas and they smoked their Chinupas to say, we won't go against this treaty. Well, somebody did. <laughs> They would not go against it. If they, if they smoked that chinupa, they stayed on, on their word. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, misunderstandings and, um, and the need to move forward pushed them off into little reservations today. My people would come from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota, uh, where the Suchongo are, and then the Oglalas are in the Pine Ridge. Uh, Hunk Papas, another band, uh, those were sit Sitting Bulls people. They're spread out as well. And you had your mini Kanjus, your Nobos, two kettles, and Sihasapas, which were your Blackfeet Sioux, not the Blackfeet of Montana. So what I'd like to do is uh, talk a little about what a vision is, why we still have them. And are they as important today as they were in the 1800s and earlier? Uh, as a child, at six years old, I received my first vision. I had no idea what it was about. I was just a kid wandering through the forest at night. Um, and I came upon a wolf sitting on the, the trail. Well, my father had read me the book Peter and the Wolf, so I just knew he was going to eat me right there. But instead, he started talking, and he said, why are you afraid of the forest? Well, I was, it was dark, the trees were big. It was in a redwood forest uh, north of San Francisco in, in the Muir Woods. So it was, it was pretty, pretty scary for a little kid in those days. But I had to go to town to get my sister some cupcakes and a Coke. It was a deal we made. She wouldn't beat me if I would. <laughs> And uh, so I did that for her. I write about that in the book in more detail, but um, the point is it changed the way I saw things after that because he said that the animals in this forest are like my family. And then he got up and he trotted off into the woods looking over his shoulder at me. You know how a dog can smile at you? That's kind of what he did. And I just, the fear melted away and from that point on, I was connected to the forest. I'd rather be in the forest than anywhere else. When I do a humble you, a vision quest, I go in the middle of it. I don't sit on the outsides of it. I go in the center of it, where, where the most energy is. So 
I brought this because um, it, it, can be, uh, it can be distracting. Sometimes when I start talking about visions, they come back to me just as though they had just occurred. And I, my, brain is, my brain is seeing the entire thing all over again, and I'm, I can get lost real quick. So I, I keep this to keep, so I so I keep moving and don't get hung up on something. Um, Black Elk said that his life was not an important thing to write about, but because the vision and what the Lakota were going through, he felt that was a necessary thing to speak to John G. Nyhart about in in 1930 when he gave John Nyhart the vision of the sacred tree um, and the, um, the hoop of the nation. And he also spoke of what they were going through, the struggle they were having, and some of the other visions he had. I'm like Black Elk, don't feel like my life story is much to talk about, but some of the events that I went through are, and I found them to be very similar to what Black Elk was talking about. Uh, in, um, in 1973, I received my first vision, and I wasn't even on Humblech. I was just hanging around uh, doing some deep meditation. And two spirits came in, and they sat down in front of me. Now, it's not what they did sitting down that bothered me. It's what they said. And they said, you're going to pick up the, ch the pipe, the chinupa, and then you're going to go back to the Lakota people, and they're going to teach you how to carry that in a traditional way. And when you learn how to carry the chinupa, you're going to teach the people how to reverse the negative. Oh, I tell you what, I jumped up. I said, I can't do this. And, of course, they disappeared. And for the next 15 years, I thought, oh, I avoided, avoided getting into this pipe thing. But spirits don't necessarily mean right now. Uh, they had a plan, and uh, I guess you could say the teaching began. In 1976, I was drawn to go back to the res reservation on the Rosebud to find out something about my mother's people. My great-grandmother uh, was full-blood Lakota Sichongo, and she was taken from the battlefield of the Blue Water fight in 1855, the first major battle between the U.S. government and the Lakota. The first one was the year earlier over a Mormon cow uh, where uh, Lieutenant Groton and, and 36 of his troops went in to arrest a man named High Forehead for shooting a, a dying cow. And, uh, and they ended up getting in a battle and uh, Groton came out on the on the raw end of the stick, they could say. His whole, his whole group was wiped out by the Lakota. That was the first battle. And then Harney, in 1855, attacked the Lakota on the Blue Water under a flag of truce. He attacked them, and uh, one of his remarks was, nits make lice. So it's okay to get rid of the kids, too. Well, one of the soldiers, uh, I think he was an officer, uh, found uh, Catherine on the battlefield and uh, picked her up and took her with him. And in, in those days, uh, it, what, if, they didn't, uh, if they didn't kill them, they would give them to somebody to raise. So he, he gave them to a family in, in Minnesota, in, uh, um, in around St. Louis. And, and they raised her as their own child. She had a daughter, uh, and then her daughter had my mother and, and two other kids. So that's how we came to be. We weren't born on the reservation. Well, Catherine was, but the rest of us just kind of muddled around the rest of our lives. And, and um, I'm the only survivor now of, of that. My mother passed away in uh, 2004. But she always wanted to go back. She just didn't know how. So in 1976, my son, Jeff, uh, his stepmother, my ex-wife, and I went to the Rosebud. We drove around trying to figure out what, what was going on with that place. You know, Did they live in teepees? <laughs> or did they live in houses? And, and, and of course, they, they look very much like, like what we have around here today. 
Uh, we ended up spending the night uh, in a, um, on a roadside park in the middle of the reservation with the Badlands off to the right. I didn't know much about the Badlands, but they're a rather spooky place. Lots of spirits in that area. Well, when I, um, next morning, uh, we were making, cooking up some egg and potato tacos on a little stove on, on the camp table there. And this, um, this old Lakota elder just showed up out of nowhere. And I told him who I was and why I was there. And he says, oh, welcome home, which made me feel pretty good. And then he started talking about the Lakota a little bit and some of the, some of the beliefs. I asked him if he'd like to join us for breakfast. Oh, yeah, he said. And he sat down and he had his potato and tacos. And, and he says, well, you know, I got to get to going. And I says, well, it's really nice to meet you. And he started walking in the you know, direction he was going. And I went to pick up the plates and I turned around and he was gone. <laughs> so he disappeared as quickly as he appeared and it was pretty flat, flat area. So I, I'm not sure just what that was. But uh, it was my first experience on, on, the, on the Rosebud. It wouldn't be until a year later that a friend actually talked me into uh, going into sales. Well, one of the problems I had with what the spirits told me I was going to do was I didn't much care for people. I didn't like people very much. In those days, I was an angry young man for what I went through as a child. Uh, and I just thought people were strange. I just didn't understand them. Uh, I always felt like I was way outside. I had some friends that I liked, but not very many. And teaching people anything just wasn't in my stars. So here she is, this, this friend of mine. She says, I want you to get into this, this sales thing with me. I says, well, I don't know. I don't know about sales. Oh, yeah, you'd be good. And I said, oh, I don't know. OK. <laughs> well, it turned out it was Amway. Well, little did I know about Amway, so I started studying the products. I liked the products, and then, um, then I started selling soap, and I had a lot of fun selling soap for about four years. I didn't like doing the circles and, and, and trying to uh, talk people into coming into a business with me, but I did, I did enjoy the sales part of it and, and meeting a lot of the upbeat people in Amway, and they were full of them, lots of upbeat people. And I started changing my opinion about people. I did that for about four years. And then, and then a friend of mine talked me into, hey, let's go scuba diving in the, in the Caribbean. I said, oh, I don't know how to dive. Well, we, we're going we're gonna to go to this dive, dive place. We'll get you certified. So I was certified as an advanced open water diver by SSI Scuba Schools International. And from there, about a year later, uh, everybody was telling me, oh, you'd make a good instructor. So I went to the dive college, and I became an advanced open water instructor for SSI and started teaching people how to dive safely in fresh water and salt water. And I was learning something about teaching and, and, and taking responsibility for people's lives. Amway taught me how to sell an idea. And then I realized, well, I'm starting to change. I'm starting to see things differently today. I, I actually cared about people. So over those years, I was slowly making the change. In 1988, a couple few years after, after you know, right after my, my dive experience, I did that for about four years, uh, a friend of mine, Kathy, who was a, a, a Hispanic Apache, talked me into going back to, um, to South Dakota. So we took off, went up there, and I met this medicine man named Charles Fasthorse, who was also an artist, and I met him at Prairie Edge Art Gallery. He, uh, he did some beautiful pieces, uh, war bonnets, uh, uh, lances, uh, war shirts. He, just, uh, he was a historian kind of a fellow, so he, he just did a great job. And uh, he started telling me things that I always wondered about, and uh, it's like 
he was reading my mind. He just kept feeding me information. And um, so I was very, very uh, impressed with Charles. And I ordered uh, a medicine bonnet from him with the, the horns and the single trailer that came down. And um, I was going to tell him how, how I wanted it, and he described it <laughs> exactly as I, was, as I was thinking about how I would like to see that. And a few other things I'd ordered from him, and they shipped them to me in, in uh, San Antonio, Texas at the time. Um, a, a year later, we went back, and this, this is when I received the Chinupa. This pipe, I've carried this now for 27 years. The, the bowl is made out of stone. The stem, of course, is wood. We don't smoke tobacco in it. We use a, a, a mixture called chinchasha, which is the inner bark of the red willow. It's an herb. It's not a drug, and it, and it has no nicotine. If you had, say, a congestion going on in your chest, you could actually inhale the smoke of the chinchasha. It would help heal the lung. So it, it's, um, it's a medicine, and that's what we smoke in the pipe. And we do that mainly, especially at our Sundance, so that when the children come, they can also puff on that pipe because it's not going to hurt them. It's not like smoking a cigar or, or, to, or pipe tobacco. It's not the same thing. So that's all we use in the, in the Chinupa. That's traditional. Uh, I've been collecting chinchasha for 27 years now. Every winter we go out and we pray about it and we leave tobacco and we cut the willow and then we scrape the outer bark off. It's real thin. Inner bark is pulpy and we peel that off the stick and, and it comes off green, but when it dries, it turns into our sacred red color. And we crunch that up and, that, and that's what we put in there. Seven times. Well, I took this Janupa and I went to Bear, Bo Bear Butte, which is a sacred butte in... Um, in the northeast of the Black Hills, right over by Sturgis. Climbed up on that butte, sat down, and started filling that pipe to the seven directions. Because there's spirits in the seven directions listening for our prayers. The west, the north, the east, the south, the up, and the down. And the center is where we sit. That's the seventh direction. We are always at that seventh direction. That's how Lakota used that Chinupa. It's a, play, it's a prayer tool. It's how we send our prayers. So we, we make seven prayers exactly the same to each direction. That way, if one of them is busy, maybe four of them hear it, or if five of them are busy, maybe two of them hear it. But somebody's going to get it to Creator, and that's why we do it that way. And... Um, when that smoke starts to rise, it carries those prayers. And that's why they do that. That's why they use the Chinupa to pray. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, why did, they, uh, why did they become Christian? A lot of Lakota became Christian. And uh, because when the black robes came over here, they talked of Jesus and they talked of, the, of, of Christianity. And Lakota said, oh, that's not so different. <laughs> Very similar. A lot of similarity in, in the teachings of Christ with respect to the, to the Lakota spiritual way of life. So that's why. They, they had no problem. Our medicine man that ran our Sundance, Vernal Cross, was a Catholic, yet he still practiced his spiritual way of life. He ran a Sundance. He was a medicine man. And he laughed one day. He says, yeah, we even have a Chinupa on our altar at church. <laughs> Because the, the priests there trust it not to, not to get in the way. That it's just another way to pray. So a lot of the reservation uh, churches, you know, they don't have a problem working with these Chinupas anymore because they're finally figuring it out. They're not heathens. They were a very organized uh, spirituality, organized in that we have a tradition. And a tradition... Uh, the, thing, the difference between tradition and dogma is the tradition simply allows changes over the years. Yet it has the basic foundation that we follow with, with little changes in between, with little, little changes in the way things are done. Um, my first humblecha. After I got off of uh, Bear Butte, and, and I write about it in the book, I had a rather strange experience when I first 
smoke that pipe. I'll let you read it, and that's a little funnier, maybe. Uh, lessons come hard sometimes. My first humble HGO was when I got back to Texas. I had the Chinupa, and I felt I really, I need to find out what spirit wants me to do now. You know, 15 years ago they told me, get going, and now I'm finally doing it. Slow start, but I, I did it. I want to know now, why did they want me to do that? What do they want from me? So I went to a place called Chalk Bluff in Texas. Uh, there was a heavily wooded area in this section. And in the center, I found a ring, a, a clearing. Uh, in the middle of this forested area it was a, um, about a 40-foot diameter clearing. And I went in there and knocked it down with a stick and laid my blanket down and set my prayer ties around. And I talk about prayer ties in the book, so I won't spend too much time on those. And then I stuck my, my flags out in the four directions and, and set the, um, the blue and, and the uh, red felt and the, and the green one for, for the Creator and for Grandmother Earth. And then I sat down, filled my chinupa, and started praying, okay, what do you guys want of me? Now, during that time, you don't drink any water and you don't eat any food. I was going on a 24-hour unit. I felt I could get something in 24 hours because I, I could meditate. I could just get out of my head real quick and just sink where I needed to, where, where I needed to go. So four days sometimes to get your head out of business and out of your family problems. So they take four days sometimes to, to get you to clear your mind. I can do that real quick. So that's what I, I said. I'm going to do this in 24 hours. Well, I'm, I'm praying about it, and meditating about it. And it starts getting dark. And I hear this bird. He's going clockwise through the trees. And he's going, meow, meow, like a little cat. And another one's going in the opposite direction. And they just, all night long, they hopped around these trees. And the other one went, why? 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 I couldn't figure out what kind of birds are those? A white bird and a cat bird. Ah, it was a cat bird. Couldn't figure out what the white bird was until later. Uh, sometimes spirits challenge you. And the challenge was, why are you here? And I thought about it, and I, I thought, that's what it feels like. They're asking me, why am I here? So I finally just said, I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> I'm here because I'm supposed to be. And um, as the dawn came out, I, I happened to look around, and the whole area was just covered in red ants, big Texas-sized ones. And I... Uh, I thought, oh my gosh, I should have sprayed the place. But then I remembered Metaka, yes, and I can't do that. And we've always believed nothing will cross those ties to harm you. So I said, okay, nobody's on the blanket except one. And he was walking around like he was lost, so I just kind of pointed him to the direction and he got off the blanket. And I'm thinking, wow, what am I going to do with these guys all day? And I hear a voice say, watch the ants. Okay. So I pick out an ant, see what he's going to do. I, he grabs a piece of that bra gla uh, grass I knocked down, and he's dragging it back to his, uh, to his den. It just happened to be inside the prayer ties. Uh, so he, I'm wondering whether they were going to get a vision as well. So he's carrying this piece of grass back, and he hits an obstacle, and he's struggling. He's pulling. He's got all six feet. And he's just trying to get this piece of grass over that obstacle. And he finally does, and he hits another one, and he's struggling. And I'm looking at him, and I said, hey, I think I said it out loud. Drop it. There's another piece on the other side. He wouldn't. He just kept going. And then he hit the obstacle of obstacles. That poor guy was upside down, pulling with everything he had. And this other ant came up, and he stood there, and he looked at him for a minute. And then he came over, and he grabbed that piece of grass, and together... They got it over the obstacle. And then the one that helped went off to get his burden. And this continued all day long. Well, the next day, well, the next day, the, the next event was I felt something on my arm. I looked over, and there was a tick on my left arm. I 
picked it off, pesky thing, and I threw it because, again, we don't want to cause harm when we're in our humble nature. And I'm, I'm watching those ants again, and all of a sudden I look over and there's a tick on my left arm again. I grab that guy and I said, you know, next time you ain't going to be so lucky. And I heard the voice say, watch the tick. So I, this time I threw him and I watched where he hit. He come running right back, crawling up my left arm. Throw him further out there. He come crawling right back and got right back on my left arm. And I thought, wow, what is that about? And the messages that I, I was getting from that, that day was that the, t the ants were teaching me how to work the obstacles. I was terrible at it. As an engineer, I was good because I wouldn't let go of the product until I figured it out. But in life, if something wasn't working, I'd drop it and walk off and, and forget about it. I'm not going to do this. Take my blocks and go home. <laughs> but I needed to make that change in my life. I needed to be able to figure out how to work the obstacles in my life. And I also, which I was very bad at, I had to learn how to ask for help to get through those. Sometimes I just couldn't figure it out. So rather than run away from it, I would find somebody that could help me. And I got better at that. In fact, I, uh, I even got better at asking for directions if my wife was with me. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was just something I had to change in my life, and that's what they were showing me how to do that. Now, my big problem was how do I go back to the Lakota as a mixed blood because they're not going to take me real serious. They don't trust mixed bloods, especially guys that didn't grow up on the reservation. But what the tick was telling me is, you know, you just keep going back, and eventually you'll stick to them. That's what he was telling me, that that's what I have to do. I have to just keep showing up, showing the interest until they could get to know me and get to trust me. And then finally they, the teachings begin. So that was my humble age, and that's what that meant. Um, the next one I would do would be um, 21 years ago on my first humblecha that I was going to do to start my Sundance. Uh, I've only done three humblechas in my life. The one in seven, uh, the the um, the one in '89, and then the one in uh, when I uh, when I started my Sundance. When I did that one, uh, I did this, I set my 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 prayer side up the same way sat in the middle of the forest, and I set my chinupa on the, on the rack, and I was, I was praying about that. And I saw something in the corner of my eye, and it was a big Texas-sized red ant that uh, was coming onto the blanket, the same blanket I used in my first humblecha. And in his mouth, he carried a black ant. And he went all the way around me in a clockwise circle and went right back out the same place he came carrying that black ant in his mouth. And it took me a while to figure out what that meant. And then right in front of my chinupa, right here, was a tick just sitting there looking at me. Didn't get on me, didn't bother me, spent the better part of the day just looking at me. And then he walked off. Uh, I guess you could say my spirit allies are red ants and ticks. Some people have lions, tigers, or bears. Oh, my. But it's not the size that counts. It's, it's the meaning behind it. The little small red ant or the little small tick can bring you such incredible understanding of what you need to do. Most humble H's, we go because we want to know what they want of us. What, why do they want us? What do they want us to do? Everybody in this room has something you're supposed to be doing. Nobody is unimportant. Everybody has something we're supposed to do. Some of you already know what that is, and you've been doing it for years. 
Some of us ain't got a clue. We're just going, I don't know. I'd like to do this. I'd like to do that. That's probably what you should be doing. You should probably be doing what you like to do, what you want to do, because that's what's living on your soul. Lakota traditions and beliefs. During the birthing process, Lakota midwives would not allow dogs in the room, and they would keep their mouths shut. They wouldn't open their mouths. And as that child is born, and he opens his mouth to gasp for that first breath of air, the soul enters through the mouth and divides into four parts. One part goes to the, to plac to the placenta. It's called the, the chikpan, the twin. What they would do is they would take a piece of the umbilical cord and they would place it in a turtle amulet about that big for a girl or a lizard amulet for a boy. And then they would take the placenta and place it in a tree. And whatever animal ate that would become that child's connection, spirit animal, because it shares their soul. They got part of the, you get part of the umbilical cord, which is a part of the placenta. It's all connected now. So that child knows that animal out there, whatever it was, will always be their spirit ally. The next one is the, is the nagi. The nagi, the guardian. Uh, the guardian sits in the aura. It takes up that space. They call that the shadow. It knows what's going on around you, your immediate area, and it tells you things. How many of you have uh, thought, oh, I better not do that? Oh, well. And then it, yeah, you go, oh, I wished I had just listened to myself. I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. Well, that's that intuition. Women are great at it. I was thinking, I want some of that. I want some of that woman's intuition because men weren't supposed to have it. But we do. It's called our nagi. He's in our aura. And he's with us and he reports to us constantly. We need to pay attention. We need to learn to pay attention to that guy because he can keep you out of trouble. He'll tell you whether somebody is... You shouldn't be around them. He'll tell you that uh, uh, you shouldn't be in this area. You need to leave. He'll tell you, you better pick that up. And you don't pick it up, and it gets broken. You go, oh, man, I knew I was supposed to do something like that. The nagi. Um, a ghost is called a wanagi. Because when the nagi passes into the spirit world, it becomes wanagi. The next one is the Tomokan. Tomo That's the fun one. The advanced guardian. It sits in the top of the head. Ever, anybody here ever have an out-of-body experience? OBE? That's this guy. The OBE. He can go all the way to California and back. Check the area out. Come back and say, yeah, it's a good place to go. Or don't go there. Those people are nuts. Um, he's the one that, that can travel. He can also go into the future, deja vu. You walk in your room, God, I've, I've been here, I've been here, I know I've been here. I've had a conversation. I've had this same conversation when you know you haven't. That's because this guy has had that conversation in the future, and then he reports back. And then if you're... If you're uh, if you're really aware of it, you know immediately what he's telling you. If you're not, you tend to stumble into it, and you kind of remember it at that point. Yeah, I kind of remember this conversation. I remember being here. But, but he can also, if, if you can trust in him, he'll give you a heads up when you need it. He, too, will keep you out of trouble. The Nia. The breath of life, heart, mind, and lungs. It's located right here at the solar plexus, just below the heart. And whenever you hear an old elder say, I speak to you from the bottom of my heart, he's talking about this guy. Like Fast Horse used to tell me, oh, the heart just pumps blood. 
the Nia, when it's excited because that fluttering feeling in the heart, you feel that flutter, oh, man, and, and, it, and it, it really vibrates. It's the most programmable part of you. Um, it runs the entire body chemistry. Some people call it the uh, subconscious. But that guy is powerful. How you program it goes by how your health is. What do you think the worst thought or statement you could make? What do you think that would be? Anybody? What do you suppose one of the worst thoughts you could have that would be a running program for this guy? I hate, I hate myself. That's a good one. I, I hear that a lot. How about I wish I were dead? You say that, and when you say that, just like when I hate myself, you carry emotion with it. Emotion is attached to those feelings. And that becomes a running program because it feels the emotion. And finally, one day it goes, oh, okay, I can do that. See, it's that easy. It's just as easy to say, I'm so darn glad I'm alive. This is the greatest day. I'm, I'm just happy to be here. I've got such good friends. And you work your way into that. And your whole health, everything about it, will change because it will change that for you. Just like it can, it can put you in stress or it can put you in, in just heaven's gate. You know, it can really do things for you. The, the reason I bring this up is because this guy does not disagree with anything you say or do. He's your best friend. He would never disagree with you. Everything you say and do, it believes because it is that close to you. If that's what you think, that's what I think. This guy, if you sat him down right here and looked at him, he would look just like you. Because I've had OBEs where people thought they saw me in the, in the room and I was a thousand miles away. But I wasn't moving around. I was in a deep meditation. If you start moving, he's back. You'll, you'll, you'll just pull him right back that quick. And that brings me to Black Elk. When he was five years old, that little Dickens was riding around on horses with a bow and arrow. And if we sent our kid out today on a horse with a bow and arrow, DCSF would have us locked up by morning. But that was natural for them. Five years old, out riding a horse, learning how to shoot a bow and arrow. And he was going to shoot this king bird. He was getting ready to shoot it. And that bird looked at him and started talking. And the bird said, the clouds all over are one-sided. Listen, they're calling you. And he went, whoa. And he looked up, and he saw two Wakia, thunder bean people, coming from the north head first, flying, and they were singing a song. And they said, a sacred voice, they are calling you. In a sacred voice, they are calling you. And then they turned and they went north, and they turned into geese. Now at five, he's not supposed to have these kind of visions. This is something for adults to have. And so he didn't know how to tell his parents or anybody what he had seen, so he just kept quiet. Well, they didn't let, him, they didn't let up on him then. They waited until he was nine years old. Had, who, who here has read Black Elk Speaks? It's a great book. And I suggest, you know, that one is what this book is about. Uh, when he wrote, when John G. Neihart wrote Black Elk Speaks, he interviewed Black Elk for that. And Black Elk told him of this vision. And Neihart put it in the book. Black Elk told it as it happened, though. So it's very, very confusing. You're going, whoa, what are dancing horses all about, you know? 
uh, starving, skinny, dying horses. You know, what is that all about? Well, I studied this for 25 years, and I couldn't put it down. I could not put it down. I just, I just could not put that vision down. And what I found over the years, they were showing me things. They were showing me things, and um, it was about what would have to happen in the fourth ascent. We're in the fourth ascent of his great vision. Uh, when he was nine years old, he was eating uh, dinner with a friend of his called Manhip. And he heard this voice outside the teepee say, it is time they are calling you. So he got right up and went outside to see was call what that was about. And his legs began to hurt him, hurt pretty bad. And then the voice faded away. And he got very confused and he went back in and told Manhip that his legs were hurting. Well, the following day he was out riding with his friends. And uh, they stopped at a creek to get some water and uh, his legs crumpled under him. So his friends got him back on his horse and took him home to his teepee. Well, the following day, his, his face, his arms, and legs were badly swollen. By the fourth day, he was really sick. He could barely move. But he looked out the teepee, the opening of the teepee, and he saw two men coming from, from the clouds, head first, and they had, they had spears, and lightning was flashing from their tips. And they landed not too far away from him. And they said, uh, they said, your grandfathers are calling you. So he got up, walked outside. This little cloud came, and he hopped on that cloud, and, and away they went. And he looked back, and he saw his parents, and he felt sorry that he was leaving them. Well, that was not the physical boy that was taking that journey. That was the Tolwaka, because he could get up and walk around. And he could see his parents. He looked back and saw his family. They went to a place of heaped up clouds, looked like mountains and hills. And the, and the Wakia, Oyati, the Thunder Bean people, they said, look over yonder. And he looked and he saw a bay horse standing there. And the bay told him uh, to look upon him. He said, my life story you shall know. You shall see. What he was saying was that his connection to Black Elk had that relationship. His story was Black Elk's story. The, the bay horse has a reddish brown body with black ears, mane, tail, and lower legs. The reddish part of the body represents purity and endurance of the north. That's the traditional color of the north is red. The black parts of the horse represent the west, the Wakino, the Thunder Bean people, the power. And those would become black elks, power of the Heoka, the contrary. They, 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 everything they do is backwards. They're very difficult people to work with. In fact, fast horse was Heoka. And um, I learned how to just shut up and listen to what he was saying because if I started talking, he'd get me. The Wakina, in our way, we see the Wakina as necessary part of our existence. They bring life, but they can also bring death. Thunderstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, all of those things come out of the Wakina. But without them, we couldn't survive on this earth because they bring the rains. And when that lightning strikes through the atmosphere, the nitrogen falls and feeds the plants. So we actually need them. I've found that you can have a relationship with them. It sounds funny, but all you have to do is believe it. And as the winds start coming, your trees start bending, you just take a little cedar and smudge and say, oh, please be careful. My grandfather's here. They're so old. And the winds will calm down. I've done that more often than I can count. And I don't consider myself Hioka, and I would never want to be. I'm perfectly happy being normal. <laughs> I would not want to be a Hioka. But I feel my experience with these guys is all you got to do is ask. 
and you have to believe you have the right to ask. Just say, hey, be careful. You know, don't hail so hard. <laughs> Little pieces are fine, but not them big marble jobs. They're going to they're gonna break my trees. Have, have compassion for something other than yourself, and they will hear you. The bay horse looked to the west, and he neighed, and then there was 12 black horses standing there. And then to the north, he neighed, and there were 12 white horses. And then he turned to the east and neighed, and there were 12 red sorrels, and then there were 12 buckskins in the south. They, um, they lined up four breast, buying the bay and, and black elk, and they went forward toward the, um, toward the west, and they came upon a cloud heaped up like a teepee with a rainbow for its door. And when they arrived, Black Elk looked in through the door and he saw, 12, he saw six old men sitting in a row. And the oldest spoke to him and says, come right in, do not be afraid. So Black Elk entered. And they started to um, give him instruction that, that the grandfathers were having a meeting or having a council and they called for him. So he was brought there for a specific reason. The, the, El, the first grandfather was the grandfather of the, um, of the West. His name is Tonkashla Wiyok Piata. Tonkashla being grandfather. Wiyok Piata being the West. And that grandfather gave Black Elk a wooden cup of water. When he looked in, he could see the sky. And then he gave him a bow. And he said, the water is to make live. And the bow is to destroy. Now this came from the Thunder Nation. So that became his power. To know how to use these. It's perfect balance. Life and death. And he had to learn how to use that. And that was his gift from the West. He turned to the grandfather of the North. Tonkashala Waziata. He gave him the herb of healing. That would become his medicine. He was he'd be in charge with specific things. He was called the Hayoka, and he was going to become a medicine man. So he gave him the herb of healing. He says, take this, and he says, whatever sickens you can heal. Then he turned to the east. Now, the, the, the north is where we call the white giant. When he lays his wing out over the land, covers it with snow. That's where you come up with the endurance. He separates the good seeds from the bad seeds. When Black Elk received that herb, he also received that power of the wing of the white giant. When he went to the, to the east, that grandfather, Tonkashla Wiyohim Pata, grandfather of the East, gave him the chanupa, the pipe. He says, with this chanupa, whatever sickens you can heal. So together he has the herb and he has the chanupa. And that's today our medicine men. We used to have uh, holy men and medicine men. And the medicine men worked with the herbs and the holy men worked with the pipes in, in their ceremonies. But today, they became one. They brought them together. So they worked with herbs and they worked with the ceremonies. Then he turned to the south. And that grandfather, Tankashul Ito Hakata, gave him the red stick that had blossoms and leaves. And he said, with this stick, your people will, will survive, your people will live. You must plant it, and wherever you plant it, it will grow, and it will bear leaves and birds singing and flowers. And the people will gather around it. The tree of life is what he's talking about. Black Elk went on a journey after he'd received these gifts, and he went as a thunder bean. 
and he, he flew over the countryside as a thunder being. And he said that all things feared him. But when he passed over, life sprung forward. That's that. We cannot survive without them. That's what that means. The grandfathers told him that he would see four, gener see four ascents. The first two ascents, his people would walk uh, on the red road. The last two ascents, they would walk on the black road, the road of difficulty and war. The red road is the road of, of spirituality and compassion. So for the first two ascents, they walked on that red road. Now, you have to understand, Black Elk thought he might mean generations, but if you, if you try to apply 30 years to each one of them, they don't work out because you have to be able to look at the, uh, you have to be able to look at the steepness of the ascent. The first ascent, they said, is not very steep. So it didn't take very long to get here, 13 years. The first ascent took place, and I figured all this out, by the way. It took me a long time because I had to study the actual events that were happening. 1863 to 1876. 1876 is where Custer got wiped out. But they were still on the Red Road. They were having, they were fighting. That was a part of, of their survival, is to struggle, to fight for their, for their lands, their hunting grounds. Not for the land, but the hunting grounds. They depended on that for survival. The next ascent would last 15 years because it was a little steeper. It ran 1876 through 1891 after Wounded Knee. Wounded Knee pretty much crushed them. And by 1891, the government was making sure they did not have sun dances or any of these ceremonies. They were outlawed. So their spirituality was lost. By the third ascent, they were on the Black Road, and that, that lasted 48 years. It went from 1891 through 1939. During that time, they went through World War I, and it became a world event. That's where, where not just the Lakota people were involved. The entire world was starting to show a part of this vision. The vision was always for the world, not just the Lakota people. And uh, it became more clear as they, as they began to uh, get into the second, toward the, second, the end of the second ascent, when Custer and, and what have you, when, when the government was, was not acting as good Christians, when they were forcing people off their land and taking it away from them, uh, forcing them onto little small reservations, uh, disallowing their, their spirituality, the, the way they pray. That was not, they were struggling as well, and Lakota was struggling. By, uh, by the end, by 1930, uh, Black Elk said, we are somewhere close to the end of the third ascent. He told Nyhart, he said, the fourth ascent would be terrible. The fourth ascent ran from 1939 through the present time, 2014 with 15 to 20 years left. When Black Elk, on, on his vision, they took him through the different events, the, the different um, um, ascents, and, and he saw what was gonna happen in, those, in that vision. And that's why he told Black Elk, a fourth ascent's gonna be horrible, it's gonna be terrible. And it's lasted the longest. Um, he said that um, that toward the end, though, there he saw a hoop white as daylight and starlight, and that hoop was made of many hoops of his people. And what he was saying is that the people will come to the center, and they will share their differences. They'll stop finding fault with each other's cultural and ethnic and spiritual differences or religious differences. 
And they will begin to accept each other's differences instead of trying to change each other. That's what the vision says will happen. And if you look around, it's just getting ready to start. You can sort of see it out there as happening. It's starting to happen. And that's what happens at the end of the fourth ascent. We come together and we step off the black road and we step back onto the red road, reversing the negative. That's why I wrote the book, because it's, it was, it couldn't, I couldn't have wrote this book back in 1930, because I went around, but no one else could have either. It, we had to go through all four ascents. Black Elk felt he failed, because he didn't get the tree to come. He did not get this beautiful tree to bloom like he wanted it to. But he couldn't change what was going to happen. It, it wasn't up to him. He just needed to share his vision. And when Black Elk in 1930 shared that vision with Nyhart, he planted the seed. So he didn't fail. Why did he give a vision of such importance to a Lakota person? Most people thought back then they were just heathens, but they weren't. They were very spiritual people. And he would not have changed it. Not one minute of it would he have changed. That's why I'm telling you something. When I start talking about visions, they come flying back and like they just occurred. And he, and he, and he gave it to Nyhart as it occurred back when he was nine years old. And when he gave that vision to, to Nyhart, he was 68 years old. Five feet eight. When I started writing this book, I was 68 years old. I'm five foot eight. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, but it, it is kind of fun to think about. I mean, it's just odd that he was 68 when he did that, and he was only 5'8", and I was 68 when I started, and I was only 5'8". But it doesn't mean anything. It's just strange. Hmm? Yeah, just strange stuff. Well, Black Elk, Black Elk did what he was supposed to do. He gave it to the people. And when he did that, he gave his power away. And he said that. I feel like I'm giving my power away. It wasn't his to keep. He needed to share it. He needed to give it to the people. So he did that. He fulfilled his obligation when he did that. When I wrote this book, before I got it to the publisher, I took the manuscript from me on my third Humblecha. It was raining that night, so Spirit told us, you better build little tents. So we took our tarps and we drove some, some sticks in the ground about that high, and we laid the tarps over them like a pup tent. And we crawled up in there, and that's where I had my humble age, because it rained all night. And I was sick, too. I, I didn't want to have to do that, but I had to have the humble age. So I went out. I had two guys I put on the hill. My, um, my helper put me out. And here I am sitting there coughing, sneezing, and snorting all night and feeling terrible, but I'm going to have this vision. And the next morning, I heard something come over the top of the little tent. It went zzz. I said, what was it? It came from north to south. Pretty soon, I heard it come back zzz. And then it came over, and it looked like it peeked in the door. And I, I couldn't think, what is that, a hummingbird? Is it one of those moths that fly like a hummingbird? It was big. And it took off to the south again. Pretty soon it came back, zzz, and this time I saw it. It was a hummingbird. And we sat outside the, the door of that little lodge of mine. And then it came inside, and it came right about here, and it just hovered inside there with me. And I'm looking at this guy. He's already acting different. It's not the way they should act. He goes down. He looks at all the Kleenex and the little paper bag I had, and I guess he felt bad for me. Come back up. And he went down, and that's where I had the manuscript. He went over the manuscript, and he came back up, and he sat there. And then the voice said, you know, when you wrote that book, you gave away your power. And I thought, you know, I gladly give my power away if it helps the people to understand. 
backed out, and off he went. So that's, that's why I wrote this. Uh, there's so much more about the clarification of his vision in that book. There's so much to read if you can find a, uh, a copy or pick up a copy of Black Elk Speaks. You will not regret it. It's a great piece of work. It's gone around the world. It was one of the best sellers for a long time. I know the, um, the Nyharts, they became very close friends of ours, and they support the work I did. So they're still, still pushing Black Elk Speaks. Ginger and I went up to the Nyhart Center in Nebraska, and they bought a bunch of my books and put them in their library, and uh, we celebrate the Nyharts uh, and Black Elk together now. Uh, I wondered what you would have to say about, you say we're in the fourth ascent. Uh, people have probably brought this up before about the, just the way the, the whole ecology of the planet is disintegrating. You know, you've been up in the Dakotas, the fracking, the clear cutting, the rising seas, and you know, everything. What, what would you say about that? The fourth ascent brought chaos, unbelievable chaos. And out of chaos comes the understanding. People are beginning to question these things. And that's going to be a natural order of things. The people are going to start questioning, why are you doing this? Why are we going to war? We're all related. All things. If you break us down into our smallest parts, we're all made of the same stuff. And the Lakota knew that. And that word is one of the most powerful words they have. It's metakoye oyasin. When we start taking better care of everything around us, we'll solve a lot of problems. It's going to be real hard to have a war with your relative when people begin to recognize that is a standard to bear. I don't want to go to war with this person. He's my relative. He's different, and I'm not here to change him. I'm going to accept him for his differences. And he's going to accept me as called being, um, being brethren in a way. To respect each other's differences is so important today. And we need to get there. We do need to question things that don't seem right because it's the chaos that brings that knowledge to us. What's going on with ISIS and... and uh, Wakantanka, the great mystery, the up said to Black Elk, hundreds will be sacred, hundreds will be flames. That means that not everybody's going to see the light. But for so long, the negative was so much stronger than the positive that we're starting to come into balance now. Fast Horse told me, he says, Quentin, he says, negative's much stronger than the positive. He says, but you wait and see. In another 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to notice a shift. And I see that shift coming. People all over the world are starting to question things. So what your answer is, just keep questioning. Because eventually, those people that are acting out of sorts are going to have to step to the side. They're not going to have the power over us any longer. But if you just stay quiet, then they'll just keep acting the way they do. Today, more and more people are starting to ask questions. And they're not, they're not happy with what they see. We have a question that, from someone watching through the internet. What did your vision uh, indicate would be the fate of humanity? It wasn't my vision, it was Black Elk's. Uh, I'm just reading the question. The fate of humanity, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the fate of humanity is uh, so, many, um, so many people misunderstood Black Elk's vision to mean that that the world would come to an end. It wasn't that way. The world will find, will find 
uh, a better place. Hundreds will be sacred. Hundreds will be flames. They didn't say everything's going to be hunky-dory, but it's going to be a lot better than what it's been. There's going to be a lot of people that seek the light of understanding, and there's always going to be those that seek the darkness of ignorance. You can't change that. It's all about choice. What do we choose to do today? What do I want today? Do I want to learn something? Do I want to understand something? Or do I want to just hang out and be in a bad mood? Anger, uh, fear is the root of all, of the root of negative force. Courage is the root of positive force. Um, you're standing on a railroad track and a train's coming. What's going to get you off the track? Fear. Fear. So we reach out, we borrow that, jump off the track, it goes by and say, Phew, that was close. You got to put that back though. If you don't put that tool back, you'll be afraid of trains the rest of your life. And I think a lot, of, a lot of problems we're having with our soldiers today is whatever happened over there, they used those tools, but they didn't put them back. And it's, and it's dragging them down. Post-traumatic stress. I believe that's what happened. Sometimes you have to use those tools to survive, get off that track, but then you have to put it back, because if you don't, you're going to have problems. You can't live in fear. It'll pull you down. It'll make you sick. Now, if you run around with a positive, courage, courage, well, that'll make you sick too. They're tools. We can only borrow them. They're not ours. They belong to those two forces, positive and negative. The fate of humanity is we're going to get through this, but we're going to do it together. And we're going to spread the word, and I've already challenged Lakota people to go out there and start talking. Bitako ye oyas. You won't want to fight with your, 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 your relatives. Somebody's going to call for a war and nobody will show up. We have to protect ourselves. But you got to be careful because you don't want to pollute this guy. You got to be very careful what you say and what you do to people. Those are the teachings of Black Elk. But I took it from, from his vision, what he saw, and I clarified it. And I worked out the kinks because I understand the, the traditions around it. And when you can understand that, then it makes more sense to you. I don't have to, I don't have to write that book for a traditional Lakota person. They already know this. <laughs> they should have wrote the book. But, um, and I didn't want to write the book. I did not want to do that. Everybody was, you should write a book. I don't want to write a book. Nobody want to read my book. It just wasn't something I wanted to do. I had to pick and pluck my way through that whole thing. It took me two years. That's my semicolon finger. <laughs> That's the only one that worked on it. But I literally picked and plucked all the way through that. And I got it done. And then I got it uh, published uh, by Word Branch and uh, we'll see. Hopefully it'll, it'll go out and it'll help people to understand. Could you describe the, the symbolism or the um, meaning for the Lakota of the Tree of Life? Just a brief kind of... Oh, yeah. That's a good one. The Tree of Life is it stands at the center of the nation's hoop consists of all the leaves, the blossoms, and the birds. We make up its leaves and blossoms. And when we begin to fall away from our spirituality, we, the leaves, begin to fall from the tree. So that tree that black elk is trying to plant is everybody coming together and making up all parts of that tree, the tree of life. We make up that tree. We are the leaves and the blossoms. 
That's usually at the very end of my book. I gave it away, but that's okay. <laughs> At our Sundance, um, on tree day, we go out and we find a cottonwood, and we cut it down. And we're very careful. We have the women bless it first, and we pray about it, and we leave a lot of tobacco, and then we bring that tree down. We do not let it hit the ground. The dancers catch the tree, and it's a big tree. It's 40 feet tall. It's got a nice fork in it. We carry that tree back to the arbor and upright it and drop it in a six foot deep hole. And we feed the tree and we pray around it. And that becomes a symbol of the tree of life for the dancers. They don't pray to the tree, the tree becomes an antenna for prayer. You pray at the tree, the prayers go up. So a lot of times at our sun dances and place like that, we do use it as a symbol of that. Um, in Black Elk's book, toward I think it's toward the end, he talks about the rainbow hoop. And I wonder if you might, for everyone here, explain, is the rainbow hoop the um, coming together of all the nations on the earth, all the colors? And also, you might even touch upon the colors of the Lakota, the red, yellow, black, and yeah. white. Yeah, the rainbow does represent. Um, I, uh, Ginger and I have found where that where that place is. The you know the the rain the um, the rainbow teepee of Black Elk's vision. We actually found the earthbound location of that, and uh, it's in it's at Needle's Eye in South Dakota in the Black Hills. And it's a stand of stones that sit in a circle. And they're 50, 60 feet tall. And when you look, when you look up, like if you lay down out there on the, on the pavement and looked up, it looks like a teepee. And the tunnel going, going through it on the outside of it is the eastern entrance to this circle of stones. And from inside that tunnel at nighttime, you can see that rainbow going up and down the opening of that tunnel. It's an energy field, and you can speckles of light and energy, and they just go and they just shimmer up and down that. And um, that's the earthbound location of his teepee roofed of, of uh, clouds. This one is roofed of stars. The, the colors, uh, the traditional colors, uh, are, are black for the west, red for the north, yellow for the east, and white for the south. Blue for Wakantanka, which is the great mystery or God. Green for Unchimaka, Makaina, Grandmother Earth, Mother Earth. And, and Black Elk said that was a grandfather. Well, they don't have male-female things. They're, they're both. So Unchimaka can also be Tonkashla, Maka. And, and that color is green. And do the colors relate to the races of men? Yeah. The only thing Black Elk did in his vision is he put white in the north, red in the east, and yellow in the south. He didn't mess with the black. You know, you don't screw with another nature. He didn't. He did not. He did not mess around with the West. That stayed black, but the mirror image is what switched that. So you're in the spirit world. Spirit world's a mirror of this world. But uh, yeah, those colors are important, and and that that applies to the term. That applies in Black Elk's vision. Uh, the cornerstone of his vision is Mitako Yayasin, and he never says the word. But in everything that's going on in that, you're going to see it. Every animal of every kind, the water was dancing, the creeks were dancing. Um, everybody was dancing to the song of the, of the stallion. Matakoyasin. 
all of our relatives. It's the spirit of these things that he, he speaks of when he says they are dancing. It's the spirits of these things that are coming together in the spirit world. 